Section 17 of The Dial, May 1920, by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Matt Perard. Section 17, Jens Peter Jacobson, by Paul Rosenfeld. Niels Lenn, by Jens Peter Jacobson. Translated from the Danish by Hanna Ostrup Larsen. 284 pages the american scandinavian foundation new york jacobson's poems and novels are part of general european literature their influence has by far transcended the boundaries of denmark characteristic of danish literature at the moment when under the leadership of brandis it was seeking to confront the present though they are distinctively national in their softness their sweetness their dreaminess they have nevertheless played an important role in the development of the literatures of other countries that of germany in particular jacobson the lyrist stands in something of the relation of a forerunner to george to rilke to hoffmannsthal to the entire group of excessively refined and hieratic modern german poets jacobson the romancer contributed largely to the defeat of the naturalistic school of novel writing and it was precisely with niels Lenn that he helped exorcise zola from the teutonic lands and bring about the recrudescence of the analytical novel for just and poetic translations are the rule in germany and niels Lenn, little diminished in the process of adoption appeared in german at the moment when its power was in the zenith it was the moment when the reaction against the complete preoccupation with the composition of society and the complete neglect of the psychology of the individual of which zola and his followers all over the continent had been so guilty had begun to gather headway in artistic circles the century it will be remembered had begun with transcendentalism and seen flourish a novel that mirrored and analyzed almost exclusively the self indeed for the novelist of the romantic school the world itself was but an emanation of the ego but with the rise of industrialism and the ascendancy of its accompaniment positivism the novel had swerved into the study of the forces and conditions of nature and society to which the individual is subjected the self ceased to interest exclusively and diminished in importance for the novelist in balzac the two worlds the subjective and the objective are still fairly well balanced but with the arrival of naturalism the psychology of the individual was degraded to minor importance in the novels of zola the characters are not very much more than types prostitutes laborers peasants and so forth the world is conceived as having an existence entirely independent of the visions of the characters indeed it is almost conceived as having an existence entirely independent of the vision of the novelist himself to be sure zola had defined the naturalistic novel as nature viewed through a temperament in truth however his ideal was the scientific document the abstract and passionless narration of facts had he been able he would have created fictions approximating the deadly reports of social investigators luckily for the novel zola oftentimes failed of his goal he was too much the poet the tediousness of complete impersonality has been attained only by his unique disciple pierre hump still his theories his pseudo-scientific attitude continue to weigh upon the form before the visions of the novelists all over europe there continued to float the ignis fatuus of the experimental romance the scientific work however toward eighteen eighty five the individualistic reaction had set in the self was once more become the centre the principal matter the object of analysis the new psychological novel was born bourget introduced stendhal anew to france maeterlinck translated novalis in germany folk ceased laughing at the romantic school 
and if the pendulum did not swing back all the way to the ground of the romanticists if novelists did not again conceive the world as an emanation of the ego nevertheless zola's conception of a world independent of the vision of his characters was entirely abandoned impressionism the study of the external world as the mirror and revealer of the self came into being henceforward landscapes inanimate nature the objective world were to be represented only because of what the characters felt toward them and because of the strata of their selves revealed in the transference and niels line gave the young german novelists of the nineties a distinct and serviceable pattern for it is the picture of the states of soul of an individual the record of the development of a sensibility it concerns itself almost exclusively with the inner life of the hero with his feelings and moods rather more than with his actions it is the moments of intense consciousness when the soul is incandescent that jacobson dwells upon neil's fantasies his moods and spiritual states are developed at length in all their cloudy beauty the author seems continually bent over the murky unplumbed regions of character where sits enthroned the destiny of individuals moreover neils himself is a figure intriguing to northern artists for the conception has in it something which the sensitive man of the north feels as always felt to be true of himself unfriendly nature has always tended to produce folk rich in inner development in imagination in the power of feeling and poor in the power of action and enjoyment and Niels, as well as most of the characters of the novel his mother bigham mrs boy fenimore gerda are dreamers dainty and lacking in will-power in all of them there is the devastating northern longing the yearning of the human being cast into bitter climes for the warmth and ease and carelessness of the south and the sun all of them like the painter in pater's imaginary portraits are famished for the something in the world that is there in no satisfying measure or not at all neil's mother passes her girlhood in a perpetual daydream tries to find a reality in marriage is cruelly disappointed and sinks back bitterly into her fantasies only during the months when she is slowly wasting away to death when her desires no longer have strength does life come close to her and does she taste of the beauty for which she has pined all her days niels himself is a distant relative of the prince of denmark in more than race he is one of the company of the half poets apparently gifted for creation possessed by all the sensations from which poetry is supposed to spring dwelling in exquisite and poignant emotions he never achieves anything some inward fatigue weighs upon him he too cannot successfully leave his dreams for reality a learned writer in the imagine several years ago pointed out the character's fundamental bisexuality and the significance of his attachments to his mother and to his friend eric life slips through his fingers his friends die or become estranged from him whatever he sets hand to turns out tragically he can find no one with whom he can really share his life his relationships with men and women are spoiled by his damning passivity and lack of direction after the death of his young wife and child he loses all interest in living death in the war of eighteen sixty four puts an end to a life that was nothing more than a great promise broken and then the world of niles Lynn is exclusively the world of niles proper vision the very quality of soul of niles and his mother comes to us through the landscapes and descriptive pieces of the novel because of the fatigue the exquisite sensitiveness the unsatisfied yearning of the protagonists the world of the novel is suffused with delicate and tired sunset hues all the pale and wistful colors of the spectrum both the strong vibrancy of noon and the black passion of night are absent from his color scheme the novel has the quality of a late autumn afternoon a windless tranquil hour of waiting when both strong desire and strong regret are absent 
and when in a mood of reverie and forgiveness we let the world glide from us a sense of something honey-sweet faded and delicate pervades it the smell of lavender old spotless rooms feminine refinement the springtide when it comes flooding the shores of the smiling lake where the anemic northern woman lies dying is strangely perfumed and idyllic and caressing not at all shrill nor humid nor cruel but pretty almost a delicate drift of naive bright flowers a sparkle of gliding water a rain of sweet soft lights and scents and the vignettes of the damp dreary northern fall and the wet endless baltic winter which we are given are almost equally soft and sweet and faint but most contributory of all to the power of the book was the unusual loveliness of its surface the naturalistic novel is characterized after all by looseness of form and repertorial style the zest to approximate the appearance of life to depart from the classical forms and constructions and to utilize the vernacular had made zola and his group disregardful of the demands of the medium the actual problems of their art jacobson on the contrary was in love with suave rounded forms and with the ring and tongue of words how deeply he was the literary artist the larsen translation unfortunately little reveals though it is more faithful to the original than the general run of translations to which we here in america have become accustomed its prosiness and stiffness its air of being all too patently the translation prevent it from representing jacobson quite fairly for jacobson is the seraph of danish literature even in the german translations his novels are prose poems frau marie Grob is the work of a sort of prose vermeer of delft its style is suffused with a bland sweet light that recalls the pearly canvases of the magic dutchman and niels len is a lyrical novel a chain of songs and flights in novel form its language is to a great degree the inherited language of poetry the rich simple colorful language of the lyric poets the diction has a certain ceremonialism a slow proud march a quiet and magnificence the words defile in gentle melody the prose is full of images moods are birds with strong pinions the soul speaks to niels like wild challenging trumpet blasts like exultant fanfares blossoming sprays build rose castles vaulted choirs of roses spring comes up the alpine valleys in triumphal march and one delicately handled episode follows another jacobson must have sunk himself fully into each of the moods of his book must have sought to drink in their beauty completely must have dwelt with them till he had extracted from them all their beauty one scarcely knows which one one prefers episodes such as the story of bertholine's girlhood and marriage and disillusionment or the description of neil's encounter with his young aunt in the darkened rose-scented room or the scene where he overhears the conversation between bigham and Adele, or the chapter where he falls in love with love or that in which his mother languishes and dies in spring-kissed clarins might stand by themselves as a, as a fine lyric stands and yet as lovely a thing of its sort as it is niels lynn is not jacobson's most perfect work marie grope surpasses it as a work of art jacobson was a sick a dying man when he wrote it and his illness in one or two instances dimmed his artistic vision the last chapters of the book which deal with the mature life of niels are somewhat thinner than the first unable to live himself out because of his consuming malady jacobson was doubtlessly unable to face the maturity of his character with the same ardor with which he faced his youth almost nothing is said of the wedlock of niels and his girl wife only one scene is described at length and that is the scene at the deathbed and then the novel is over full of premature deaths practically each of the principal characters meets an untimely end niels father and mother die in early middle life adele eric gerda the child niels himself perish in their youth 
it is as though jacobson aware of his swiftly approaching end and overcome by the tragedy of his own existence had unconsciously wished to insist on it to bring the sense of the sadness of a lot like his own forcibly home to his readers still despite these blemishes the work has a particular importance an importance quite apart from its influence it is jacobson's realistic representation of himself if marie Crow and the shorter prose works and the lyrics are no less expressive of jacobson and in certain ways more perfectly expressive they are nevertheless more idealistically so the tale of what life did to the exquisite seventeenth-century lady is jacobson in an ideal representation the history of the nineteenth-century dreamer fru gariff und zart und traurig as hoffmannsthal has qualified him is jacobson situated in his own time connected with the denmark of his day in this latter the author sought to draw the line closely about himself to utilize experiences of his own to trace his features accurately in it he sought to voice his particular loneliness his sense of the nullity of his existence his deep disappointment in it he set out to write his vita somnium breve and he accomplished what he set out to do one can demand nothing more of the violet than that it be content to remain the violet and jacobson though he had far less appetite less volume less flow than had some of his great contemporaries in france and russia even in england did situate himself in his time in niels len did achieve his own style of auto-portrait one shuts the book with the sense of satisfaction that arises from having encountered a piece of work that is entirely one thing and one finds oneself wondering whether the little novel does not contain in hard form something that is in many of us to-day as it was in many of those of yesterday and that will be in those who are to be born to-morrow and the day after End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of the Dial, May nineteen twenty, by various. The LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Section eighteen, A Divine Beachcomber by Evelyn Scott, Noah Noah by Paul Gauguin, translated from the French by O. F. Thies, illustrated. One hundred and forty-eight pages. Nicholas L. Brown, New York paul gauguin according to some authorities was born in paris on the seventh of june of eighteen forty eight his father who was a parisian journalist a breton by birth died during a journey to lima while yet a young man his mother was a peruvian creole gauguin ran away to sea when he was fourteen and so presaged for us his later adventurous spirit but returning to paris when he had just passed adolescence he temporarily belied the fears of the more cautious among his friends and relatives by a determination to pursue a sensible calling in his anxiety to reassure society with the commonplace it desired he became the employee of a well-known banker in this capacity it was possible for him to wed a danish lady of depressingly unimpeachable respectability though it can hardly be said that gauguin was ever a father nature made him responsible through this alliance for several children then suddenly without warning at the age of thirty he turned vagabond and painter almost in the same moment not that he became a physical exile from the beulah land of bourgeois success so early as this the outward sign of the inward grace was slow to accumulate he began painting on sundays while the remainder of the week was devoted to a kind of remunerative penance at last however his determination to express himself conquered the habit of clerical diligence and he devoted his entire effort to becoming an artist in eighteen eighty he first exhibited landscapes in the manner of pizarro the following year he showed besides similar landscapes a study of a nude woman of which Hoisman wrote that no painter had as yet struck a note aussi vehemente dans le rio 
from this time forward his work took an unexpected trend and his emancipation was as swift as his preparation had been deliberate manet and degas were the strongest influences which affected his maturing talent gauguin did not doubt the sincerity of pizarro and monet but he did not find in them the colors that he remembered in the luxuriant shores along which he had coasted in his youth and he began to seek for models to affirm this recollection in eighteen eighty six he went to brittany and painted his first independent landscapes he was displeased with the result of his experiments and impatient with the surroundings resolved on a journey to martinique here gauguin saw a new world and the revelation reaffirmed his spirit of revolt on his return to france he found the method of pizarro who had been his first admiration more than ever impossible cezanne and manet were now the painters whose work approached his ideal it was about this time that van gogh with whom he had previously become acquainted in paris persuaded him to come to arles according to gauguin it was van gogh only who profited by their association but it is probable that each gave something to the other as the friction of their contradictory natures called forth in each complementary reactions van gogh to the end of his life retained the greatest reverence for his older comrade and in a letter to gauguin written shortly before his death continues to address him as maitre a detail which gauguin in one of his communications to charles maurice cannot forbear mentioning in any case it was during the time passed at arles that gauguin produced what were from the coloristic standpoint the most notable pictures of his european period including his extraordinary yellow christ perhaps gauguin's vanity suffered from overcrowding in europe for he began to long once more to return to the tropics his friends were compassionate on may twenty one eighteen ninety one the first performance of Maeterlinck's les intrus was given at the vaudeville for the joint benefit of gauguin and verlaine the proceeds of the entertainment covered the cost of the long-anticipated journey to tahiti after eighteen ninety one gauguin returned to europe only as a visitor bringing with him some written impressions of unusual foreign life which appeared in book form under the title noah noah and some superb pictures which reflected a more profound experience the french edition of noah noah has intercalated between gauguin's original narrative chapters first by charles maurice somewhat in the manner of occasional music this verse while polished detracts rather than adds to the significance of the book and is wisely dropped from the english version by the good taste of the translator o f thighs who has lately given in our alien tongue an excellent rendition of the little volume noah noah is a narrative of charming if specious simplicity which in the opening pages with a deliberate absence of literary preparation transports us to the unfamiliar city of papite the tahitian capital gauguin has recounted his experiences through disconnected incidents and the absence of other than a chronological sequence in the events described lends the book the appearance of being an unstudied transcription from life as a litterateur gauguin has all of the delightful vices from which his pictorial and sculptural art is such a spontaneous escape he paints his tahitian models with respect but as he writes of them his regard is full of that fastidious sentimentality of the man of culture for the race toward which he holds a position of unassailable superiority gauguin with less taste but a more successful artlessness writes like pierre loti a kind of exalted and impressionistic journalism flavored with self-conscious wistfulness he is with intent the painter wielding the pen never before have we been given so much of the literal color of the tropics the color which assails the eye as if with defiance all life comes to us in his lines as if through the eyes and watching the bare feet of the girls in the roadway they agitate us as though with their strong toes they gripped our souls there is a delicious description of vaituai 
a real princess who however conducts herself with more imagination than the royalty whom we are accustomed to see photographed for the illustrated journals i feel like comparing this narrative to a similarly personal volume by a christian missionary an african trail by jean mackenzie and i perceive in the hatred of her kind for savage practices especially the more cruel incidents of sexual ruthlessness a fear a little nearer reality than the attitude of moral protectiveness which gauguin assumes toward those from whom he has never felt any menace there is something pathetic in the grotesque contortions of inverted morality with which the christian ethicist would saddle oblivious nature but i sense in the book by a woman the insight of the weak through which they appraise the ways of the strong always a keener gaze than the casual vision with which the strong behold their inferiors in gauguin's make-up there was no need for the christian legend for he had not at least at the time noah noah was written discovered his necessities the social feelings were always beside his needs as a member of the human race he was never more than a dilettante it was perhaps because he was able to gratify every want through his art that he retained his spiritual independence again in contrasting the missionary outlook with the viewpoint of gauguin i am reminded of that age-old rivalry between woman and the arts woman whose maternal disabilities confine her freedom within the limitations of the moralities warring with nature for his possession she dare not permit man that faith in himself which makes the social compromise superfluous so early in his childhood while he is yet subject to her she attempts to impregnate his soul with her pessimism art because it also ignores the social compromise she must consider an alliance with the enemy there are moments in noah noah when gauguin escapes from his pretense of humanity then only the trees the lizards the silence the ocean and the earth exist with the painter and where he touches form and especially color his reactions spring from the depths of his being and anticipate deception so that his constant desire for the picturesque arrives too late to affect his utterance out of the placid and impersonal perfection of the sea and sky and bronze foliage we can imagine the evolution of the deliberate figures which adorn his canvases figures which give us the impression of an eternity that is at once substantial and fleeting they are as heavy and placid as the huge clouds which hang on the horizon with the weight of mountains yet are at any moment liable to disintegrate in most descriptions of the alien environment the author in subconscious conformity to some idea which dominates his attitude his attitude will eliminate much that is for him irrelevant but necessary for the fidelity of a realistic impression gauguin visualizes his tahiti so completely because he does not discriminate in counting the trivial and the grandiose details of his surroundings there was a moment in the silence of the forest with no other companion than his male guide totefa when gauguin awoke with the sudden shock of his strange surroundings to a supreme a distorted instant of being the first impulse of self-intoxication was toward an act of violence but his exultation developed in him a kind of menacing calm a grandiose feeling a little absurd which prompted him to take the axe from his guide and fell a tree with it persuading himself as the blows resounded on the trunk that he could lay waste the forest before him the boastfulness of his mood gave him hallucinations of the sort that beset children he was a god walking light-footed across the tops of the mountains he had created nevertheless as he suggests to us his isolation and the grandeur of his surroundings he stirs within us a contagion of the sense of elevation and power like echoes we play his game of defiance it was after this orgasm of the spirit that gauguin pursued by a feeling of unrest which he pretends not to have understood undertook a pilgrimage to one of the remoter parts of the island but instead of continuing his journey to this destination halted at the first strange native hut where he was offered a wife to her a girl of thirteen 
when the time comes for gauguin to return to france and part with tahura he gives a final sight of her as she sits on a stone on the quay calm exhausted with weeping her feet touching the soiled water the flower which she has put behind her ear in the morning fallen wilted on her knee this tableau of departure is from the pen of the parisian who sees in all life an opportunity for reticent adornment gauguin the writer has not permitted the rhythm of his beauty to be interrupted by ugly moral jerks but his harmony is false being arrived at only by exclusion to gauguin the painter beauty is so inclusive that the contradiction which would have remained outside in the work of another has been swallowed up by his inspiration and ceases to exist gauguin's homecoming on this occasion did not bring him the anticipated triumph and a succession of disappointments culminated in a financial sense at least when in eighteen ninety five he had a sale at the hotel de which realized a contemptible sum he longed as before for the distinction of exile for alone it is possible to remain dignified in failure Carrier procured him a cheap passage back to tahiti on the pretext of an official mission ill health and further financial difficulties now kept him away from europe to the end of his life gauguin from the beginning in papite to the end in the even more remote marquesas preserved himself through his very real difficulties with all the consolations of self-pity he was sorry for himself when he found there was no way of equalizing emotions with a child like tahura he was sorry for himself because he went to the wilderness when already too exhausted for unmodified pagan experiences he was sorry for himself when his implacable wife wrote him in terse language of the death of the daughter whom he had elected to abandon the truth is that gauguin like most persons felt it outrageous that he was expected to make irrevocable decisions there are many things in the psychology of this unpremeditated genius which suggests the typical marooned white whom one continually encounters in tropical lands like all of these derelicts he preserved the double privilege of his failure among the natives he was the white man distinguished forever by his superior in formation no matter how low the european may sink he will usually find with the dark-skinned aborigines those who are willing to assume some of the burden of his support for the doubtful benefits of association at the same time with visitors of his own color gauguin was distinguished though often looked at askance because of the race among which he had cast his lot to the missionaries of many years standing for whom he had the most unreserved dislike is meted out something of the same fate for where they maintain a nominal financial independence and are at liberty to put an end to the term of exile whenever they have the courage to recant their license is curtailed by the incapacity for readjustments which the passage of time develops and they are able often for years to pity themselves for the lack of those adjuncts of their original environment which could no longer be of any use to them gauguin on account of his financial troubles accomplished his removal to the marquesas with some difficulty having encountered opposition from his wife whose legal consent was required for a disposal of his meagre belongings some years before robert louis stevenson had visited eva Oe, and his comments on the marquesans heighten our conception of the people among whom gauguin passed his last days at the time stevenson visited here he found these the least impressed by civilization of all of the polynesian groups but this race removed from cannibalism by only a decade or two was the handsomest and in many respects the most pleasing in the south sea islands their salient temperamental characteristic however was their profound melancholy and the continual fear of death which expressed itself in the morbidness of their mythology this terror was constantly reiterated by the appearance of the islands themselves which had become through successive epidemics that on different occasions all but demolished this race of physical demigods veritable tombs 
on every side were the evidences of death in graves unburied skeletons and ruined pepes or native habitations during forty-six years the population in one district had declined from six thousand to less than four hundred the dead of the marquesans were jealous of the living and beyond the grave indulged those customs of cannibalism which the white man no longer permitted in life and to offset this constant menace from repugnant and merciless superbeings every act of existence was protected by the art of the witch-doctor in this atmosphere of superstition which treasured death as so vivid a commonplace gauguin suffered for everything but the actual means of subsistence waiting like so many tropical expatriates the relief that was to come from the land beyond the sea when i read of gauguin's last days i thought of a whitewashed church on a hill by the seaside in a south american town and i remembered the excitement of the three americans and the two englishmen who constituted the foreign population when the signal flags were run up on the tower announcing the first mail-boat dispatched from a war-ridden zone in over thirteen weeks or in benguela in west africa in that climate of depression and ennui the same continual agitation in expectation of a letter the letter there is not one among the banished who does not await his letter sometimes it is a love letter sometimes it is a letter which is to bring news of kin more often as in gauguin's case it is the letter which is to bring money as some monotonous lives at home are sustained by faith in the miracle of religion so is the life of the exile made bearable through his confidence in the letter which will one day arrive from god knows where and bring fortune with it the native who attends on the white man also believes in the letter this passage of mail back and forth to and from the unknown is a proof of the favor of the gods which rests on the white man for the native does not receive letters and existence holds for him only those familiar things which he can see and touch of course in most cases the letter fails to arrive day follows uneventful day the tropical foliage withered as if by the breath of despair shrivels gray in the heat autumn comes the rains begin thick white clouds descend to the very earth and in the mist through which nothing is visible but light one hears the shower a sibilant and barely audible music which seems never to cease it is spring perhaps that spring of impeccable blue skies against which the young mango leaves hang in sharp reddish bunches there are no shadows anywhere on earth and along the glaring beach the dead fronds which still hang on the coconut trees rattle huskily in the warm wind then a flag is run up on the church tower of the council's flagstaff a ship is in sight suddenly we understand that the day has arrived the low houses look bright and strange the stretch of sand sparkles curiously as if with intention the palm trees clash and swirl their green swords against the cobalt blue of the sky on the sapphire waves hundreds of white caps burst in abrupt explosions like seed pods which have ripened and scattered to the air little showers of white far out some thin disappearing streaks of silver show where a group of flying fish has darted up then like a strange presence approaching something for which we have no name appears the ship the tramp steamer or third great passenger boat which carries mail she is like the bark bearing the grail more alien she seems as she looms larger to the shore she will stand off or she will be able to make a landing but in either case hours may pass before the mail is out hours in which one is never for a moment unconscious of that presence a presence so vivid and compelling that it is almost sinister rusty she may be faded vermilion streaks on the dingy hull which they are beginning to paint boats cluster to her sides and sweating natives jostle each other in the hurly-burly of dust clouds while their songs and cries echo above the indolent creaking of the pulleys impassive enigmatic she rests motionless in the lap of the water and when for some freak of the engineer her whistles blow it is as though one listened to the voice of the colossi in the dawn at memnon 
about her keel float potato peelings and a curious reddish-brown scum which is a mingling of seaweed and refuse here and there the dark blobs of quicksilver shadow are covered with an opalescent skin of kerosene like isinglass a sandy-haired man in his shirt-sleeves his collar open at the neck leans over the far from immaculate rail chews a tobacco cud and half closing his dull twinkling eyes spits luxuriously in this man as in everything that pertains to the vessel one feels a glow of proprietorship and interest the wooden pier the houses gray in a sudden shower the rustle of the ragged sage-colored coconut leaves as they bend and twist against the dun and silver sky the bitter smell of rain all of these things seem breathed as from the permanent atmosphere of the ship their familiarity is the familiarity of the steamer which one has never seen before they and it have been and ever shall be as they are in this beginning instant hours pass the mail has been distributed but the letter is still missing how many months will drag by before we are allowed a repetition of our disappointment it is five o'clock in the afternoon the sun shines again but moistly and indecisively past the point surmounted by three palm trees past the fort whose crumbling walls are covered with orchids past the fishermen naked to the waist who look very small as they stand far off upright in a canoe which moves out which the waves oscillate so that it seems continually to rise the ship moves out she is a two-master with a single smokestack her spars appear almost unbelievably fragile as they pierce the diaphanous sunshine a flat sluggish moving hull lies heavily in the shadow and blown toward the land from the squat chimney like a morning scarf waved in the breeze the purple smoke hangs in a tattered fluttering streak above the twilight blue of the water smaller the ship on the horizon all the melancholy of that unbroken line culminates in a minute point which grows every moment less the ship disappears sea earth sky all are as empty as the womb from which a child has been torn the wind as it blows inland over the ocean that knows no winter seems colder the fisherman's canoe is grounding on the beach the men up to their waists in the sea pulling the boat against the dragging of the tide which is moving imperceptibly out the waves still a pale green roll roll in one continuous desponding undulation with the hopelessness of the tide which will after all never escape the shore the sun sets abruptly dropping quickly like a shot bird behind the mountain top and at the same moment color is drained from everything and the night rises like a vapor as if from the earth one thinks with unreasoning depression of the steamer already lost between two solitudes each of which seems to reflect and magnify the other and the land of the white man is farther by a million miles than it has been that morning the night elongates nothing can halt that inexorable ship which drags the darkness after her until miles and hours are won and in her wake the shadows unwind in long streamers of black for gauguin bedridden with a disease which was probably the combined result of a syphilitic taint and the malnutrition which is so often produced even in those accustomed to it by the inadequate diet of a primitive people the letter came too late you imagine him in one of those houses of types so similar all over the tropics houses which permit of no reserves and you see him lying in this hut day after day waiting for the ship wondering perhaps which will arrive first death or the materials which will allow him to paint the natives were indolent they were curious but some were not altogether indifferent to the white man's fate these acquaintances who surrounded him watched the end approach regretfully but with the resignation of savages which without intention utterly isolates the person in distress however gauguin had chosen his bed and died in selected surroundings so that as a man we should offer him no regret his tenacity in the pursuit of his dominant aim was extraordinary 
but it is the only quality expressed in his personal confessions which would command more than a commonplace regard yet if there is little in the man stripped of his art which would arrest our admiration there is enough in the painter to make christians of the most grudging christians who welcome the artist who has shirked everything that society obliges with the same feast prepared for the drudge of responsibility i have heard it objected that gauguin was no primitive that he touched his savages with the brush of parisian sophistication instead of considering this statement as a depreciation i find in it the simplest explanation of the fidelity of the painter's reaction to savagery it is the thing that forces upon us a conviction of separation which impresses us most our senses register the foreign experience with superior acuteness and the individual who compels our recognition is he who by the sharp definitions of his personality reiterates his distinction it is the law of being which orders that the great be lonely and that death grip most firmly the imagination of him whose life is intense the hieroglyphic drawings of savages express an elemental reaction to the accidents of existence but the primitive man so little self-aware cannot feel himself so keenly apart from his surroundings the more sophisticated we become the more we realize our isolation in in an intensifying perception of what lies outside us and this vision is itself the recognition of the impassable barrier which surrounds us the stimulation which our senses receive from the pictorial art of the earliest historians results from the shock of extreme alienation imitation however is always a lie since for none of us does there exist an identical reality to attempt through an effort of will to approximate the spirit of the primitive in his approach to life is a futile artifice for the truth he sought as his own does not exist for us at best we may represent it in an ideal or purely decorative manner as a conventionalized motif which permits of interminable repetitions i doubt that the sensuous experience of the primitive is deeper than our own but though this be so its articulation through art must be less vivid no one indulges in the superfluous creation in the moment of living before creation can become a complete act there must be a definite realization of self with a will which sustains through its means the flash of an involuntary joy or sorrow in the savage this will to self-expression can be little more than a tendency and the savage man reflects his own individuality only through remote inferences for an inconclusive recognition of elemental life gauguin's method was almost perfect he did not attempt to make intellectual patterns of the life he got at second hand as might a painter who worked backward from ideas to emotions gauguin was for an immediate effect his personal reaction to this unaccustomed atmosphere the limbs torsos arms which gauguin painted seemed to flow upward from the earth the strange trees the flowers the men the women even the stone figure of some inscrutably ugly deity are as synthetic as the landscape which on waking one morning one sees from the deck of a ship simultaneously in all its parts a new world has come into being gauguin painted in bold strong outlines with occasional dreary plains but in giving us a nude without traditions he extended the frontiers of art far beyond the confines of tahiti always he used clear and simple colors complaining to others that their work was never light enough and much of his strength was drawn from his avoidance of the weakness of overfinish in his picture of a youth between two girls which is representative of some of his best attributes there is a perfection of grouping an exquisiteness of line and a mastery of planes which give perfect satisfaction here so little is analyzed that we are left to appropriate everything in a single emotion this is a primary religious feeling which supersedes a stereotype declaration of a god a feeling that is impossible when the emotions are considered before they are articulated for to criticize and appraise is to take account of a universe which exists 
only in parts with the mathematical erection of a patchwork deity the emotional conviction of unity departs forever dio venons nous que sont nous ou allons nous is the title of what is i believe his most ambitious painting the theme of this canvas is human destiny birth to the right is represented by the mother and the lately born death to the left is suggested by the old woman crouching in an attitude of brooding but stoical despair in the centre of a fantastically impressive landscape a huge maori stands plucking fruit in the background is a calm and grotesque idol with uplifted arms and semi-distant from the foreground appear symbolical figures which gauguin himself has named vanity of speculation and certainty of another existence this picture perhaps a little too pretentious in composition nevertheless forces upon us a conviction of its inevitability the metaphorical inferences which half emerge from the more obvious aspects of these languid plains are like words formed by the lips in silence they command us to an attention which one never gives to what is clearly overheard and the effect upon us is a sense of imminence of continual approach as though the finger-tips in the darkness rested upon something unseen which for ever eluded the grasp here life and death instead of contradicting one another are the common flowers of the same melancholy peace in one of his letters gauguin hopes that he may be allowed two years more of life in which to discover himself it is quite possible that this often insupportable egoist erstwhile the too picturesque proprietor of the shop in the rue versingetherie while he was so doubtfully supported by the opinions of others in his heart was but half aware of his own profundity for there is nothing in my work which could produce bewilderment save this savage strain in me for which i am not responsible he writes not long before his death in a letter to charles maurice gauguin failed to realize that it was the truth always strange which bewildered his contemporaries and what staggered critics was not barbarism of some local origin but the unknown which is invariably barbarous every human work gauguin continues is a revelation of the individual hence there are two kinds of beauty one comes from instinct the other from labor the union of these two with the modifications resulting therefrom produces great and complicated richness gauguin's work was truly a revelation of the fidelity of instinct for only the will is able to enjoin a lie and the artist whose intention is directed from the subconscious depths of his being where the will is evaded is unable to falsify logic is unscrupulous as ready to impose an appearance of harmony upon a fundamental discord as to adapt itself to an exposition of truth the intelligence may modify but should always make itself subservient to the inspiration an artist with brains should at least at times be wise enough to refuse to think gauguin fortunately in the comparative poverty of his intellectual understanding could not entirely elevate himself above his sense impressions so that he was compelled to be great where his often tawdry wit might have dictated artifice physics chemistry and above all the study of nature have produced an epoch of confusion in art and it may be truly said that artists robbed of all their savagery have wandered into all kinds of paths in search of the productive element which they no longer possess it is true that i know little but what i do know is my own by preserving the unique quality in himself he was able to draw from the stream of life before the intellect had made it barren it is impossible to feel and to appraise an emotion with the same breath and as a consequence of this disability the intelligence is aware only of what has already ceased to exist the element in gauguin's work which he was pleased to describe as savagery took rise in his perception of the existence of all things as simultaneous with his own this was what gave his work its static quality in his paintings the universe and the artist live together in an eternal now 
education is our means of recognizing the past and gauguin for whom there was nothing but the present was essentially uneducated it is for this reason that the aesthetic renegade has the privilege of vitality but for culture all great works of art would remain forever contemporary the mission of culture is a denial of the present through which we learn to endure a purely retrospective existence and to construct the future as an inverted past unhappily conventionalized judgments soon grow in the public mind to represent the work of the great dead and these master spirits are finally allowed to communicate themselves only through the inferior minds of their disciples let us then take advantage of a diminishing opportunity and acquaint ourselves with gauguin before his challenging outline is smudged with tradition lest the shadow of posterity fall backward on his canvases and obscure those strong figures which gain their effect of flatness and simplicity through the uniformity of tropical light End of section eighteen section nineteen of the dial may nineteen twenty by various this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section nineteen briefer mention by anonymous a landscape painter by henry james two hundred and eighty seven pages scott and seltzer is a collection of stories early flowerings of the portentous genius of their author they are superior stuff, but the fashion of believing that James corrupted his style in his later years is proved silly enough by the fact that, intensely passionate and fine as they are, they do not quite come off. For anyone else they might be considered little masterpieces. For him they are but the grammar of novelettes. The Matrix by Maria Thompson Davies 260 pages century lights another beacon to celebrate the post-bellum discovery of lincoln it is a gentle taper attempting to tell the story of the girlhood and wooing of nancy hanks with simplicity the author occasionally lapses into primer technique a maturer style could have given form to a more enduring romance evander by eden philpotts two hundred pages macmillan presents the english novelist tracking a favorite theme of his back to the borderland of mythology where it is threshed out amid a verbal clash of the gods evander is one of those self-righteous male beings with a serene ignorance of human emotion such as philpotts drew in the thief of virtue and more recently in storm in a teacup the projection of this type against a background of pagan philosophy gives the author a satirical scope less marked in his modern stories luca sarto by charles s brooks three hundred and sixty pages century tilts a merry lance amid the sombre moderns with their black visored freudian fiction unfolding a lively tale of conspiracy and adventure laid in paris in the days of Villon, it has the sparkle of brightly burnished armor and a pulse quickening pace the manner of the telling is not without a touch of swagger spiced with the salt flavor of the modern point of view humorous and whimsical a novel to the king's taste if there are still kings who can boast that quality the tall villa by lucas mallet two hundred and fifty six pages doran a husband in south america a ghostly lover and a wide-eyed fragile and excessively lovely lady bring a fresh variation on the eternal triangle in this story of love in the fourth dimension it is the last straw in spiritism and about the last straw from lucas Ballet. where angels fear to tread by e m forster two hundred and eighty three pages not is trite only in title this is what meredith and the gallery would respectively term comedy and tragedy with somersaults of motive and swift 
satire the story makes its way from england to italy where childlike sinfulness and the sunshine of medieval towns are refreshing after the irritated misunderstandings of the english family who rushed in handmade fables by george aid illustrated three hundred and thirty two pages doubleday page are so many essays on compensation they deal with such worldly assets and liabilities as time's whirligig turns topsy-turvy and whatever their individual prejudices each fable has at least one robust american prejudice collectively they maintain a general optimism regarding man's plight in the world as it is here mr aid once more demonstrates that the american slang vernacular has capacities for clearness force and yes elegance that quite escaped the baseball reporter some personal impressions by taki jonasku two hundred and ninety two pages stokes is reminiscent of the illusion time when diplomats were regularly called distinguished the author sometime prime minister of romania had all the notabilities of europe on his calling list and most of them got into the book one way or another portraits of american women by gamaliel bradford illustrated two hundred seventy six pages Houghton mifflin boston is a series of politely written impressions of seven new england women and one middle westerner drawn for the most part from letters and diaries the portraits are far from clear and abigail adams and margaret fuller would be chagrined to know how dim they have become even to an admirer hither and thither in germany by william dean howells illustrated a hundred and thirty one pages harper undertakes the by no means slight task of ignoring the intervening upheaval and writing as if such a thing as war had not occurred this circumstance combined with the tranquil orderly nature of mr howells's style gives the volume an almost antiquarian flavor the mr and mrs march of their silver wedding journey are here conducted with care through descriptions of hamburg leipzig weimar berlin and the rhine country on the last page mrs march remarks that they romped through germany but that is merely a touch of homeward bound hyperbole a sportsman's wanderings by j g millet two hundred ninety eight pages Houghton mifflin boston reflects the catholic taste and broad horizon of the man whose career has followed such diverse trails as those of soldier and artist naturalist and landscape gardener here is a readable blend of lively reminiscence and first-hand observation without verbal or scientific excess baggage the american credo a contribution toward the interpretation of the national mind by george jean nathan and h l mencken one hundred ninety one pages not lists some five hundred tersely stated articles of belief superstitions and near superstitions in some of which almost any american will see certain facets of his mind unflatteringly mirrored more than half of the volume is occupied by its preface for which the authors advance the one excuse that having read it one needs not read the book a grateful choice the quest of the ballad by w roy mackenzie two hundred forty seven pages princeton university press professor mackenzie of the english department of washington university has recorded enthusiastically his experiences while collecting ballads from delightful touchy old men and women in nova scotia his volume contains suggestive notes upon the nature of variations in the old songs from singer to singer and concerning ballads of well-attested local events where the proportion between the actual and the imagined may be observed notes of great value to students of folk literature modern american poetry an introduction edited by louis untermeyer 
a hundred and seventy pages harcourt brace and howe follows through broken country the contemporary reaches of that strong troubled stream of poetry which flows from whitman though it too often misses the authentic current is too often led away into stagnant marshes it is perhaps as good a map as we yet possess the editor is a better conversationalist than guide macedonian measures and others by john mccloyd forty one pages cambridge university press england is the work of a young poet who strives not so much to measure himself with life as with other rhymesters he comes out pretty well in the encounter he has a powerful rhythmic sense and the knack of handling intricate verse forms yet evidently his serious work still lies in front of him as a war poet he ranks somewhere between alan seeger and lorana sheldon the bard of bath maine the tempering by howard buck seventy-seven pages yale university press is the first book of verse wherein jubilant youthfulness unwearied even in the poems of war experience marches to gay pipes with a sweeping stride and an idealism unappalled war dobs by r watson carr fifty-six pages john lane is aptly named imperfect assimilation might be diagnosed as the chief malady of these sketches from dugout and camp the author has completely digested neither his war experiences nor the aesthetic of the new poetry despite his force and sincerity he is treading a little too closely in the footsteps of a more famous contemporary the wedding guest he beat his breast where he heard the loud sassoon the genius of the marne a play by john lloyd baldiston eighty six pages nicholas l brown new york as an introduction on the theory of inspiration mr baldiston it says seems to think a man of genius is but the mouthpiece of a voice speaking from beyond very good as applied to napoleon and joffrey at the marne but no indication is given as to the author's own inspiration and no necessity to assume its existence is created by reading the play pan islam by g y m burry two hundred and twelve pages one map macmillan is an unpretentious attempt to explain the ways of the moslem world to that suburban electorate in whose hands the government of the british empire with the aid and consent of the permanent undersecretaries in the foreign office ultimately rests the carnegie peace commission should send the last chapter a plea for tolerance to every missionary organization armenia and the armenians by kevort aslan one hundred thirty eight pages macmillan presents in condensed form the history of the armenians from earliest times down to nineteen fourteen the work is translated from the original french by pierre Crabit, whose introduction is an impassioned plea for armenian independence patrons of democracy by dallas lore sharp fifty seven pages atlantic monthly press boston criticizes private and vocational schools as destructive of democracy and urges a uniform national public school system as the educational basis for living together this essay had the distinction of being publicly laughed at by graham wallace but in so far as we differentiate our educational courses by reference to pecuniary rather than to biological differences mr sharp's polemic against any kind of differentiation should be helpful in restoring our social equipoise europe in the melting pot by dr r w seaton watson four hundred pages seven maps macmillan is his latest book on the problems of the european settlement partly written before the armistice it expresses the principles and prejudices of the new europe for integral victory against bolshevism or the league against imperialism and is especially well informed and obstinate in dealing with southern europe 
local government in ancient india by radhika mud mukherjee two hundred and twenty nine pages oxford university press widens our western european perspective of the guild system and municipal institutions by demonstrating the existence of the same modes of associative life at the vedic headwaters of hindu civilization a book to place alongside vinkatarama ayar's town planning in ancient Deccan. an irishman looks at his world by george a birmingham three hundred and seven pages Duran carries the reader into a temperate mental climate where the winds of doctrine are silent and the dust of controversy no longer threatens the eye the method is expository the author's judgments are equitable and the conclusion is a fling at those who have created an irish problem by confining themselves to the political problem of ireland we irishmen all of us are spending most energy on what matters least the form of the state and far too little energy on what matters most the making of men that education which goes on continuously from the cradle to the grave the opium monopoly by ellen in lamont eighty four pages macmillan is one of the best arguments yet advanced against the mandatory system pieced together at paris with personal observation and official records at her service the author shows that great britain is benevolently drugging to death most of the subject races entrusted to her care the monroe doctrine and the great war by arnold bennett hall one hundred and seventy seven pages mcclurg chicago is an admirable summary of the foundation of the doctrine its evolution and its relation to the league of nations the author believes that when all the criticisms of the monroe doctrine have been examined most of them will be met by more tactful and diplomatic methods of its assertion a scrupulous and sympathetic regard for the dignity and rights of latin american republics and the abandonment of the spirit and idea of the united states hegemony in pan-american affairs the war with mexico eighteen forty six to eighteen forty eight by justin h smith two volumes eleven hundred and ninety two pages macmillan presents an elaborate but not very plausible justification of the policy of the united states government in this conflict the author contends that mexico had systematically violated american rights for many years before the war and scouts the theory that the annexationist ambitions of the southern slave owners exercised any appreciable influence and his final conclusion is that the war was a rather good thing for both countries socialism in thought and action by harry w laidler five hundred and forty six pages macmillan cannot be dismissed merely on the ground that it is a textbook for the truth is that it excels in its kind and ever since mr william english walling turned his back on himself nothing of or near its kind has been produced in english dr laidler has that discreet receptivity for conflicting opinion and dogma which gives his work within the limits of socialism the stamp of a firm intelligent neutrality his appraisal of socialist thought and his description of the international movement are thoroughly adequate the new york state board of regents should make this text required reading for all albany legislators established or incipient the army and religion a report edited by the rev d s cairns four hundred and forty seven pages association press is as far as one may judge an uncensored summary of evidence gathered from some hundreds of men serving in or connected with the british army the investigating committee found that the war had created or revealed a widely prevalent theism of the vaguest sort but that in most cases the men did not connect their religious emotions with christianity and were in fact farther away from the church than ever the suggestions as to orthodox means of 
overcoming this difficulty are perhaps less significant than the confession of its existence origin of government by hugh taylor two hundred and fifty nine pages b h blackwell oxford should be dedicated to laon a cheval it is an argument for the strong self-imposed ruler who is believed to arise at every period of social crisis to save the body politic from chaos and by a stroke of mental sleight of hand this ruler is identified with the conquering warlord who creates the social crisis in the communities upon which he inflicts himself devoted largely to a criticism of spencerian ideas the origin of government has that lax unfamiliarity with modern scholarship which makes much minor british thought a hunt for originality through the thickets of crotchetiness perhaps mr taylor avoided holstie's relation of war to the origin of the state in order that he might leave to his descendants the task of coping with his contemporaries moslem architecture its origins and development by g t rivoir translated from the italian by g mcin rushforth three hundred and forty illustrations three hundred and seventy three pages oxford university press is a comparative study of moslem architecture as exhibited in its religious edifices the interest of the text is technical and archaeological but the splendid collection of photographs with which the book is interleaved cannot help enthralling the most cursory student of architecture the cossacks by w p cresson illustrated two hundred and thirty nine pages brentano recounts in the romantic mood the history of the frontiersmen of the czar's old empire the book is not to be taken too seriously as a contribution to historical literature but vivacity of style and the wild western color of the subject matter made the pages interesting enough the skilled laborer seventeen sixty to eighteen thirty two by j l hammond and barbara hammond three hundred and ninety seven pages longman's green is the third movement in that great symphony of the industrial revolution which the authors have essayed to compose out of the now open files of home office correspondence the martial note is predominant or as the authors observe at the beginning the history of england at the time discussed in these pages reads like a history of civil war but in spite of the fascinating episode of oliver the spy the social and economic themes are never unduly subordinated the result is a tragic history greatly told the flow of value by logan grant mcpherson four hundred and seventy three pages century is an examination of prices profits wages and capital along the lines traditional in commercialist economics the categories are pre-scientific abstractions like utility and the descriptions of processes in spite of the author's wide experience in railroad transportation are consistently hypothetical the book is not so much a fresh contribution to economics as an illumination of the possibilities of that new reservation of time which william jewett tucker has pointed out as the crown of a busy administrator's career End of section nineteen section twenty of the dial may nineteen twenty by various the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard section twenty the theatre by gilbert seldes the current month in the new york theatre has been a constant temptation to the reviewer who wants so much to set a date on things the piece which stirred him most dated from three or four centuries before christ the production which caused the most comment was written in the seventeenth century a d the criticism which the month brought forth seemed to go back to that dim age when discrimination was not yet the proud property of the human race and the present reporter to make his point 
must invoke december eighteen ninety six as a temporal shield that season lacked the new lighting and the higher stagecraft but it was a fine year for it was the best of those years in which bernard shaw was critic for the sanity review the month was the month of sir henry irving's production of richard III conscious of the incapacity of any one individual to make headway against the tide of approval setting in for john barrymore's richard i have turned to mr shaw and find these words written about one barry sullivan if he had devoted himself to the drama instead of devoting the drama to himself as a mere means of self-assertion one might have said more for him so much for barrymore so much by implication for arthur hopkins of the three men concerned with this production robert edmund jones alone comes out of it with a great artistic achievement to his credit his ingenuity and his imagination are equally admirable and the fact that he provided a setting which literally towered above mr barrymore and the ill-chosen rabble of his caste is not against him it is not mr jones fault that he was asked to do well by a play which if it had not been written by shakespeare and did not provide a startling part for a very shameless actor would never have come to production at all it was a production of hamlet with settings in another very distinguished style which really gave shakespeare his chance against the medea of euripides last month the critical mind could no more be satisfied with mr hampton's hamlet than with the entire production staged by maurice brown and ellen van valkenburg but any mind at all must have been captivated by the thought that the mere subject and action not counting the beauty and dignity of the verse of these plays had more power to move us than the most current of modern themes of the latter jane clegg is an example if the emotions of an audience can be stirred by illumination of their own lives if careful observation and faithful transcription could project the accent of truth into the spoken words of a play mr irvine would lead this noble field of dramatists with jane clegg mr irvine actually sinks a few inches deeper into the rut of our serious writers for the stage his only accomplishment has been the complete bewilderment of the critics the dismal school of playwriting has never been so well served by the dull school of actors the theatre guild has all unconsciously done a perfect thing the setting the voices the tempo the grouping of this play are faultlessly suited to the subject this in itself is so rare a phenomenon that the critics praised it but since neither they nor the audiences took the trouble to find out why the play was so thoroughly unsatisfying much had to be made of the restraint of the acting it apparently did not occur to those who spoke of it and ordered some of our more tearful players to go see and be lessened in the art of acting that restraint in itself is no virtue especially when the dramatist has through some oversight neglected to supply one single human passion for the actors to express one wonders what shakespeare or shaw would say to a playwright who took a few snips and shreds of feeling stuck them to the bare mast of a social thesis and pretended that he had a sail filled with the violent wind of human energy if our actors and critics really cared a rap about restrained acting let them observe the work of mr russ whitehall in the letter of the law it is brew's great gift to endow one or two personages in his thesis plays with life to give them background and depth such a one mr whitehall undertook to portray with a fineness and justice unsurpassed in many a day of our theatre here were emotion which grew with every check put upon it and a quite exceptional intelligence mr lionel barrymore was much better in this play than any one who had seen his nary had any reason to expect but it is mr whitehall alone who created the tragic dignity without which the play would have remained foreign to our lives End of section twenty section twenty one of the dial 
May 1920 by Various. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Section 21. Comment by the Editors. They order these matters a little more viciously in England. The literary life of London has an acerbity for which we find no parallel in America, perhaps because the art of controversy does not flourish here, perhaps because neither our sober nor our inebriate artists are so convinced of the exclusive completeness of the truth they have been lucky enough to hit upon when we find the london mercury a young but eminently sober review damning the dead with the definition blast a flatulent disease of sheep talking of dealers in chaos and quoting from patience we suspect that the literary gulfs and ghibellines are rioting in kensington and are not surprised to hear privately and from one of the moderns that no artist who had any self-respect would allow his name to appear in the review which mr j c squire is editing with such a fine sense for evenness of tone we wonder whether this bitterness is as much a symptom of health and power whether all the heat is the fire of inspiration or a little of it simply fever temperature and in a very practical way we wonder whether it is necessary to reject anything in the old forms or the new except the dishonest and the shallow and the feeble in execution the question is practical because the dial has set itself the task of including a great many things which fall under the ban of one or the other of the challenging pontiffs of art as we have said before the place of a contributor in any movement backward or forward does not concern us and until we are convinced that we are in error we shall hold to that principle from an aesthetic point of view the world is and probably always will be divided into people who think that every able-bodied man should be compelled to work at least six hours every day and people who do not the alignment makes some rather peculiar bedfellows on one side are mr gompers the y m c a general wood the republican party the democratic party the bolsheviki mr edison mr brandeis the socialists and all right-minded persons on the other side are the vicious and idle rich a few priests some tramps some artists some orientals some anarchists and other persons whose hearts are not in precisely the right place it is not hard to see which side is the stronger but the weaker side would gladly forego a complete victory being too busy with other pastimes to bother cud-chewing conversation and dyspeptic dreams all they care about is that a few scuppers should be accidentally left open through which those who sincerely desire leisure might slip modestly out of sight the mobilization must not be so efficient as not to overlook somebody now and then this is not a plea for privilege but for something easier to supply a little inefficiency perhaps this ancient perquisite of humanity will some day prove its salvation the devil may have all the good tunes but he no longer has a monopoly of press agents he who was despised and rejected of men particularly men of action is already the priceless servant of both sides and may be master yet there was a time a better time when the man who wrote was considered harmless enough not to-day at any moment the obscure rhymes of a very second-rate poet may be read in the senate as evidence and no doubt the theories of professor einstein had they been advertised during the war would have been put down as most insidious bits of enemy propaganda by both sides since he is a swiss and the logical sensorial outcome of his ideas must be the denial of absolute justice it is no longer safe to be a novelist although it is very profitable to be one and the detached thinker if one is left is in danger of being summoned as a witness 
on the merits of prohibition or industrial democracy it is rather amusing to find that the practical men are the ones who are nearest to panic at the sight of a bookstore while the literary philosophers are going in for direct action in any case letters are looking up they have come to the level of journalism and are nearly on an equality with strike breaking still it is hard to consider john addington simons or robert browning as the hired press agent of italy or turgenev as the secret mediator in the franco-russian agreement the muses are having their revenge at last and as usual the ironic muse of comedy is preparing for the last laugh last month in our paragraphs on the financial side of art we suggested a method of speculation for persons who were willing to wait twenty or thirty years for their returns there are persons however who expect to die who do not love their children or who have some other reason for wishing to realize quickly on their investments and as these people are in the majority we shall probably devote most of our space to their problems first then let us warn them against the critics whose opinions are not at all sound financially ordinary advertisements are a much better guide to the value of a product than most critical articles criticism in fact is only a shady form of advertising the critic does the advertiser's dirty work no advertiser for instance considers it professional etiquette to abuse his rivals openly in an advertisement he can do no more than warn against imitations when he wants to say something really mean he gets a critic to do it for him we do not wish to imply that all the critics are for sale with the exception of the musical critics they are scarcely sensible enough but the simple fellows can easily be got round by a little flattery and can be persuaded not only to run down competitors but to sing the product's praise as well and in terms the diffident advertising man would blush to employ the idea however that the critics set the pace of the market is ridiculous a few a very few anticipate the fashion the majority can scarcely keep abreast of it perhaps the best criterion for placing a critic is the language he uses if he is still talking about plein air if he still condemns arms because they are like bananas and praises them because they are like arms if he quotes tennyson or huysmans or oscar wilde or george moore you may be sure that he is not on the artists of the coming mode are painting with entirely different intentions and how on earth is he going to guess which one is going to succeed but more of this later end of section twenty one end of the dial may nineteen twenty